Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Gwath Me. Please stand with us as we worship.
I came up here at the 8 o'clock service, and you probably not known this, know, have noticed this yet, but we've got a big new podium up here. I brought my Bible, and it was the size of this nickel. So anyway, this is beautiful. And the reason we uh, have this big new podium, uh, aside from uh, Chris Boma's uh, immaculate uh, ability to make stuff, and he's already mad at me. He'll punch me later. Just do the, just do the right kidney, not the left one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, anyway, it's because we want the Word of God central. So, believe me, he was going to make this thing like, you know, like, you ever seen those, you ever seen the old pulpits? Right? Amen. Right? You look like the little guy from the Wizard of Oz behind it. Like, but we sit under the authority of the Word of God. Amen? So, I'm very, very appreciative for this. All right, just uh, real quick, we are going to have a, a special uh, recognition time. Mike Holland's going to come up here and uh, recognize uh, some of our young men for some of their accomplishments. You know, oftentimes when the Apostle Paul was concluding one of his letters, he would call out specific people by name. In uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 12 through 19, he specifically mentions seven people. And three of them, in verse 18, he says, such men deserve recognition. So I'm so thankful at, at Gwathmi that we have so many uh, godly men. I'm thankful for our pastor uh, and our elders. So this morning, though, we want to specifically recognize eight men. Uh, and these men have passed some specific milestones in our Colossians 2-7 discipleship training. These men have demonstrated an ongoing commitment to become obedient, well-rounded disciples. Uh, they study and memorize God's word. They, uh, they pray for their brothers. They pray for their families. And they pray for the lost. They're learning how to encourage and challenge other Christian men. And they're getting better at being a solid witness to specific lost men that they know personally. So the four men who just recently uh, completed book one in the Colossians 2-7 training, I'm going to call your name and uh, come forward, please. Tim Brannon. Dana Brown. Greg Perrier. Dennis Woody. And we're not done yet. We got four more. 
So these four men, they recently completed book two in the Colossians 2-7 training. So come forward when I call your name, David Barber. Travis Blankenship. Patrick Warren. Mike Cawthorn. Is this the Presidential and Fitness Ward? <laughs> <laughs> I want to say something to the wives of these men. Thank you for being flexible with the time that they're putting in. We appreciate that, and you know, we hope that you're seeing some benefit from that. But when you see these men individually, uh, encourage them, congratulate them, uh, and just remember that it takes some effort to grow in their faith. They're putting that in, and your encouragement goes a long ways. That's all. Thank you, gentlemen. Good morning. Welcome to Gwathme Baptist Church and welcome to everybody out there online who's watching us this morning. Sorry you're not able to be here in person, but uh, I pray you'll be blessed nonetheless. One of my favorite things to do is when we're all in a group together, we need to just take a minute and show our love for each other. You know, especially somebody who doesn't like to be hugged or touched, go hug them the most. <laughs> Just take a minute and let's just say hello to our brother and sister this morning and just be thankful that, that we're all here together. All right, I guess everybody is uh, getting their way back to their seats. It's, it, it's so encouraging to see the smiles on everybody's faces and the love we have for each other. That, what we just saw, was a form of worship. That is a time for us to get to know each other, to get to be closer to each other, to, to just be a part of each other's life. We've been learning in the book of Job, you know, Job had his buddies that were there with him, kind of telling him what he's been doing wrong the whole time, and you know, what, what you did, you're getting what you deserve, and I contribute that to, they didn't know Job very well at all. It's easy to judge a person that you don't know very well. We need to get to know each other and be a part of each other's lives and grow together each other with each other in our love for Christ. So, I, I wanted to do that this morning just to show that how important it is 
that we not only show our love for each other, but we begin to know each other and we begin to grow together as brothers and sisters in Christ. So let's take a moment. We're going to turn our attention to our catechism this morning. So let's go ahead and, and start. What do we pray for in the sixth petition? In the sixth petition, which, which is, and, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, we pray that God would either keep us from being tempted to sin or support and deliver us when we are tempted. What does the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer teach us? The conclusion of the Lord's Prayer, which is, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Teaches us to take our encouragement in prayer from God only and in our prayers to praise Him. Ascribing kingdom power, glory to Him, and in testimony of our desire and assurance to be heard, we say, Amen. All right. If you, if you can, please, let's honor the Lord as you stand in the reading of the 20th Psalm. <clears throat> to the choir master, a Psalm of David, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of God, of, may the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your, your offerings and regard you with favor, your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill you all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation and in the name of our God set up our banners may the Lord fulfill all petitions now I know that the Lord saves his anointed he will answer him from his holy heaven with the saying the saving might of his right hand some trust in chariots and some in horses but we trust in the name of the Lord our God they they collapse all and they collapse and fall but we rise and stand upright. O oh Lord, save the king. May he answer us when we call. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, you are so good and so holy and so loving and faithful to us, Lord. Father, we thank you for who you are and for all you do and all you've done. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to be in your house to worship you, Lord. Lord, I pray that our worship is worthy. And Father, I pray that you will speak to hearts and minds that are here. And Father, I pray if there's someone here who doesn't know you, that you are drawing them near to you, Lord. Father, we thank you so much just for this time. And Father, we, we have a special prayer we'd like to lift up to you for Elmont Elementary. There's an opportunity for us to get into the school, to share the word to share your love father I pray that you are preparing that path that you are preparing that way and father I thank you and I praise you for this time and our Lord I do pray for our pastor as he brings a message today and I pray that you'll continue to heal his body we thank you that we ask this all in Jesus name amen all the room I got up here you can like move stuff like all kinds of different directions it's like it's, it's pretty awesome all right good morning good to see everybody here this uh, beautiful beautiful still late winter but closing in the spring a uh, couple of quick things before we get rolling and that is just a reminder that tonight we are actually uh, starting our adventure kids we're going to be moving to Sunday night so they'll be meeting from uh, five o'clock to six thirty tonight and from five to six we're going to have a prayer meeting here uh, in the sanctuary anyone that uh, is available we'd love to have you come join us this could be just a time of prayer our youth are still meeting tonight from four to six 
And then next Sunday night, we're going to be having our baptismal service at 6 o'clock, followed by uh, a dear friend who's going to be uh, sharing from the Word of God for us. And just over the course, share a little bit this uh, Wednesday night, but over the course of the next three months, basically uh, Sunday nights can be an opportunity for us to have some uh, very specific times of prayer. Uh, you're going to hear from different uh, preachers. You're going to hear from uh, some of the young men uh, that we've been blessed to be able to connect with as they're going to come and share God's word. Uh, we're going to have a theology night once a month. Where we're going to uh, jump into some kind of deeper theology and there'll be some Q&A time. Uh, I know the ladies downstairs on Wednesday nights were disappointed when they were never allowed to be a part of that. So here's your chance. So uh, It's going to be really cool. They will pretty much all be different. So it's going to be an awesome time. Uh, you're going to hear from missions and missionaries. We're going to have a number of folks that are going to come through over the next few months, uh, sharing both about what they have been doing and opportunities for us to be more engaged in the mission. You know, it's not missions with an S. It is a mission. It is Christ's mission. So we have a great commission, singular one mission, one single focus to share the gospel to all peoples in all places. So I encourage you to join us on any Sunday night you are available. So uh, starts off tonight and we'll go through the end of May. Also, just to reiterate, next Saturday we do have a work day. Mitchell will say more about that in a little bit. And also we're having a bake sale which helps our kids that are going to Mission Fuge this summer. So if you are interested in both uh, bringing baked goods but also purchasing baked goods, my preference, I'm glad you asked, chocolate with white icing. It don't really matter what, right? A banana, it don't matter. It's got some chocolate and, and vanilla icing on it, I'm pretty good. So anyway, that's just personally, it's a little selfish plug there. But next Saturday morning, so 8 o'clock, and I'm sure uh, Dennis and the guys would love to have as many hands as possible. Many hands make light work. Amen? So we've got a lot of things we're trying to just get cleaned up for this spring. By the way, I don't know if anybody brought, I brought a little bit of lunch today. Y'all need anything? Anybody? Oh, good. Oh! Missed it. These babies will fly, man. I believe there's a prophetic word in there. Anyway, we're doing the feeding of the 5,000 this morning. I don't think it's going to feed 5,000. Denny, you want to pass around these fish? <laughs> Somebody can have these. It won't be me. You want them? Chris, is your reward right here, Betty. Hey, these are, these are holy mackerel. <laughs> That's what they're called, holy mackerel. So, anyway, just a little visual. <coughs> <coughs> be careful. All right, I got it. It's my, that was a kidney stone. <laughs> All right, I'm going to get myself together here. All right, if you would, <coughs> if you would and you're able, would you stand with us? We're going to read Matthew 14, uh, verses 13 through 21. All right. <coughs> it says, now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from, <coughs> excuse me, from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. <coughs> but when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he said he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, <coughs> and the day is now over. <coughs> Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up 12 baskets full <coughs> of the broken pieces left over. And those who were about five, and they were those who were there were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for your precious word. 
May you give us ears to hear and open our heart, God, that we will be guided by your spirit uh, to respond this morning. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this miracle is the only miracle that is recorded in all four Gospels, aside from the very resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this is clearly an important uh, miracle, the fact that all four Gospel writers record this miracle under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it is a, <coughs> a great reminder to us of, of many facets. One, as we walk through this, we're going to see Jesus obviously multiplies the bread. But as a devout Jew in this time and place, as Matthew is writing to a predominantly Jewish audience, they would have reflected back to uh, the time of the children of Israel in the wilderness as they were uh, without food and God provided the manna and gave them food through Moses they would be reminded that Jesus here is showing himself to be the greater prophet, the greater prophet than even Moses. Uh, Elisha multiplied uh, 20 loaves to feed 100 men. Again, Jesus demonstrating he is the greater prophet. And throughout this passage, we're going to see this continual theme that Jesus is the greater as you go back into the early parts of the Gospel of Matthew, we see that even at Jesus' baptism, uh, he is baptismal, baptized in the place that the children of Israel would have crossed the Jordan River under the, the leadership of Joshua. Significant in the fact that as they were coming into the promised land, but Jesus himself is, is showing us the ultimate promised land is the kingdom of God and is an eternal rest. So throughout here, we have to see both the Old and the New Testament, both coming together, that, that Christ is, is demonstrating to not only his disciples, but to his followers. So we see here at the beginning, though, it says that now when Jesus heard this, well, what has he heard? As, as Bill last week shared, and I'm so thankful for him stepping in last week, kind of short notice, but John the Baptist had been killed. John the Baptist was the dear, dear brother, friend of Jesus. We know that the tail end of chapter 13, Jesus had been rejected by his own at Nazareth. He had been rejected by not only his family, his friends, but this very town that he had grown up in had rejected him. They had not known him to be the Savior. Shortly after, his dear brother, John, has been killed by Herod. So all this is weighing on Jesus, and it says that when Jesus heard this, following the death of his beloved friend John, it says that he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place. So we see here, the first thing is the, the context is important here to understand uh, the area. Now the Sea of Galilee, is, it's not a very large area. It's not much difference than uh, Lake Anna. If you've been to Lake Anna, you can see across Lake Anna. You can see all the way across the Sea of Galilee. Now, there may be some pictures up here uh, that you may see of this particular area, but this would have been in the northeastern part of the Sea of Galilee. You see the, the kind of rendering there. So this is looking uh, from the south, looking directly north. If you see Bethsaida there, if you were to go north and then head to the right, you're going to go into Syria. You'd actually be on the road to Damascus. If you go north of Capernaum there further and then slightly over towards the west, you will be uh, in the, into uh, Lebanon. So this is the area that we are speaking of. But the left side of the Sea of Galilee is the more populated area. That's the area where the villages that were pretty densely populated. So as Jesus gets in the boat and he crosses across that northern part of the Sea of Galilee, all the people saw him. He's trying to kind of get away. He wants to, you ever see the, uh, remember the old Southwest Airline commercial, want to get away? Well, you can envision that. He's trying to get away to withdraw, to have some time by himself with the Father. Uh, in essence, you know, he's, he's dealt with a lot recently here. And even though he's fully God, he's fully man. And, and I'm sure being rejected in Nazareth and then the death of his beloved uh, friend ha has weighed on him. So he's, he's going to withdraw, uh, but he can't. He just cannot get away. It says, but when the crowds heard, they followed him on foot from the towns. So they see him get in the boat. And then as we read through in the other gospel accounts, we find that Jesus, before he even gets to the shore, the crowds have already arrived. 
And we know again that even in Matthew's account, but we add the other accounts in, it says that there were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So we're talking about a mass of potentially 15 to 20,000 people that travel around the northern edge of the Sea of Galilee. And when they see Jesus arrive by boat, they are there to greet him. And I want you to understand that contextually. Get a good picture of this. He is trying to withdraw, but yet the people are wanting to come near to him. They are wanting to come where he, are, where he is. So these are kind of the areas. I just want you to get the backdrop there of the mountainous uh, region as you go up there. Uh, it's a very beautiful place. It's desolate, but it is actually very beautiful. So it says that they heard, they followed, and on foot. And it says, and when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. So he sees this great crowd of people. Uh, we understand the context, the place we're in now, but now he sees all these people. And so the next thing we see here is his compassion, uh, that Jesus had a great compassion for the people. Uh, uh, Francis Schaeffer uh, once said that biblical orthodoxy without compassion is surely the ugliest thing in the world. Now, let me rephrase that. Orthodoxy is to make things right, right doctrine. So biblical orthodoxy, we can have all the right doctrine in the world, but without compassion, he says, this is surely the ugliest thing in the world. He also would say the local church or Christian group should be right, meaning we should stand firm in the truth of God's word. We should have no compromise when it comes to God's word. But it should also be beautiful. The local group should be the example of the supernatural, of the substantially healed relationship in this present life between men and men, meaning that it is only through Christ that we can truly have right relationships. Only a right relationship with God will give us a right relationship with man. Now, uh, some of you know uh, Francis Schaeffer. He was uh, a missionary. Him and his wife, Edith, uh, went to Switzerland in 1948 to be uh, missionaries there. And over their time there, they would open their house to a lot of the uh, young students in the area. They would, they would come in. And it became this kind of like uh, hub for discussion, for theological discussions. And so by the mid-1950s, they had established um, uh, Le Brief, which is simply in French means the shelter. And it was a place that people could come, and it became a community. And, and Francis Schaeffer was, was, uh, w was interesting but brilliant. Uh, some of you have probably read some of his books, like How Should We Then Li Li Live, which is uh, probably his most renowned. Uh, the God Who Is Here. Uh, he is there and he is not silent are just some of his great works. But Francis Schaeffer understood this balance that we are to be firm in our foundation. We are to have a deep conviction of God's word. He was a, a staunch biblical inerrant. He believed God's word was without error. But he also had this great compassion for people. And uh, that uh, ministry has continued to this day in his multiple locations all around the world. Matter of fact, it was through that that R.C. Sproul was a, uh, was a close friend that started the Ligonier Valley Center uh, outside of uh, Pittsburgh uh, back in the 60s. became a place where young people could come, and it was a community, and they grew together, and they discipled, and they were sent out and, and did a great, great work for the Lord. But notice in Matthew 9, Jesus' own words again. It says, Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. But when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus having compassion here was not just he saw people and, and thought about, hey, what can we do? He was so moved by them, it says that he healed their sick. He's not just feels empathy like we do. We see something, we hear of a great need, we may have an empathetic thought, and we may even decide, to, hey, we can, we can support, give money to that or something. But, but this idea of compassion, this word picture in the Greek is that, that deep, deep, a pit of your stomach feeling that like you have to respond there's more that needs to be done I don't know if you've ever been you know literally punched in the gut hopefully not physically but if but if you have you know that feeling but it is that idea that deep in the pit of our gut that that earning that that yearning for just I've got to respond Jesus 
responded. It wasn't just an empathetic response, but he responded by doing something. It says he healed their sick. He, he cared. Notice again, he had tried to withdraw from the crowds because they were exhausting, right? We're exhausting. <laughs> um, you ever been in a marriage? It's hard at times. It's sometimes tiring. Sometimes you need a little break, right? It's not a bad thing. It's healthy, actually. But he tried to get away to refresh, but he saw this crowd, and so he had such great compassion. Uh, Jerry Bridges says that compassion is the deep feeling of sharing in the suffering of another and the desire to relieve that suffering. It's just a great reminder that compassion is, is getting in there. It's actually uh, allowing yourself to, to feel the pain of others, and so you can better minister, better care for one another. Now, this uh, passage we saw here, uh, we mentioned, is, all, is also in all of the Gospels. So I'm going to read the actual uh, John 6 passage as well, because it fills in a lot of detail. Uh, Matthew doesn't necessarily always give us all the detail. Matthew even doesn't even write necessarily all chronologically. Now, a lot of Matthew is, but, but Matthew's point is to show that Jesus is the Messiah. He is pointing out that he is the Christ. He is the one in whom... All the, all the law, all the prophets pointed to. So John, though, writes about his, this same account, but gives us a lot of the details that I think will help us when we understand both the context and uh, the compassion Jesus has. So in John 6, it says, After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is also the Sea of Tiberias, same sea. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. It says, Jesus went up on the mountain and there sat down with his disciples. And here's a detail that we don't see in Matthew's account. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. This is interesting because Jesus is fully aware of uh, time better than anyone else. He created time. But he knows that this will be the last Passover he will spend uh, raising up the disciples because by this time next year at the Passover will be what we call the Passion Week. It will be that last week of Christ's earthly ministry. So when he goes to Jerusalem next, the next year, he will be going there to be crucified. So he knows he's got one year. He's got a year left with these disciples. He's got a year left to pour his life into them because they're going to then be going out on their own. Now, he's going to give them his spirit, which is going to guide them and direct them, but he's trying to raise them up. And so it's interesting how he will get them involved in this ministry. So this is at the time of the Passover. It says, lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Now, it's interesting. He, he, John's gospel, he lists Philip. Matthew doesn't uh, list any of the disciples by name that are there. But John, first off, lists Philip, that Jesus asked Philip, where are we going to buy bread for all these people? Now, Philip, who's got his calculator or uh, his cell phone out or something, starts to run the figures and starts to go, well, based on this many people, he says, we're going to need at least 200 denarii worth of bread. Even that would not be, would only provide us enough to give them a little bit. Now, notice it said that Jesus did this to test him. He knew fully well what he was already about to do. But then another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to Jesus, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. Thankfully, one, uh, one mom that morning said, Son, I want you to take enough fish and bread this morning in case you need to share with somebody. Right? Amen? This would be another little kid in the crowd, and I want you to take enough that you got enough to share with him, not knowing that the very king of the universe was going to take that little means and provide this incredible miracle. So God takes what we are willing to bring and give to him. This little boy had five loaves and two fishes, and these aren't big loaves and big fishes. These are little in their, in, in their sight. So Andrew brings him there, and he's like, but what are, we, but what are they for so many? And Jesus then says, have the people sit down. He says, notice this detail, which is fascinating to think about. Now, there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. And Jesus then took the loaves, and we had given thanks. He distributed to them those who were seated. He had them seat. You know, when you sit, you sit at a feast. You sit when you're at a feast with a king. 
We don't see that so often. We miss these things. We just go straight into, oh, he multiplies the, the bread. But we're, we're, we're missing this big picture here that, that Christ is demonstrating right here and now what will ultimately happen with all of us who've placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, that we will all one day sit at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we will one day all feast with our King. He was given us this foreshadowing of what is to come as he demonstrates here. He has them seated. And so off to the fish, uh, he took the loaves and he given thanks. He distributed to them those who were seated and also the fish as much as they wanted. By the way, at that marriage supper of the lamb, I'm envisioning like chocolate fondue fountains. Amen. Right. And no diet plans. You ain't got to worry about any of that, right? Because we're in our glorified state. So it's just going to be worshiping the Lamb of God, worshiping the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And he is providing all that we will ever need for all of eternity. And said, when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that had, that had been done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Again, they're looking for a military leader. They are looking for a prophet in the way of Moses. They're looking for a king in the way of David. But again, Jesus has demonstrated that he is greater than all the prophets. He is greater than all the kings. He is the greatest. There is no other that can suffice. There is no other that can sustain. Only Christ. And, and will we, when we partake with Christ, be fully satisfied? Uh, Charles Spurgeon says that we are to love your fellow men and cry about them if you cannot bring them to Christ. If you cannot save them, you can weep over them. If you cannot give them a drop of cold water in hell, you can give them your heart's tears while they are still in this body. That's compassion. That's compassion for the lost. We should have compassion and, and care for those in need, but the greatest need is Christ. Amen. The greatest need for every person who, have ever, who has ever lived and ever will will be Jesus Christ. But notice when Jesus performs this great miracle, he, he does this by utilizing the disciples. The disciples don't even realize that he's using them, but ministry is not about just one person. Ministry is about uh, building up the body. Christ is the head of the church, not the local pastor. Christ is the head of the local church, as he is the head of the church universal. We are all understudies. I am an under-shepherd. I am serving at the beck and call of my king. These disciples were there to serve and to do what Christ had called them to do. So Christ distributes uh, the disciples through the crowd. He has them sit in order. We know from the other gospel accounts, they are to sit in groups of 50 and 100 so that the disciples can come through. So I want you to envision for a minute, because we miss so many of these little nuances, but, but odds are a crowd of fifteen to 20,000. You ever been in crowds like that? It's a good-sized crowd, right? And so they probably did not, in the back, they weren't seeing the fish and the bread multiply. The disciples are taking these baskets around, and the bread and the, and the fish, they just keep multiplying. But who's seeing? I mean, the disciples, they're the ones that are seeing this multiply. They're the ones who knew from the get-go there was only this one little kid. He had one little basket, and he had five loaves and two fishes. Most of the crowd did not see this multiplication take place. They don't realize. They could have thought that, hey, that boat's got tons of fish on it or something, and maybe somebody's just dragging No. But, this, but Jesus is, is allowing the disciples to see beyond what even uh, the average person saw. But notice how coordinated it was, because there is no chaos with Christ. Chaos is created by our enemy. Christ creates order. He is good. He organizes the people. Philip Keller, who uh, wrote uh, A Shepherd's uh, View of Psalm 50, 23, said, It is no accident that God has chosen to call us sheep. The behavior of sheep and human beings is similar in many ways. Our mass mind or mob instincts, our fears and timidity, our stubbornness and stupidity, our perverse habits are all parallels of profound importance. Yet despite these adverse characteristics, Christ chooses us, buys us, calls us by name, and makes us his own and delights in caring for us. 
So he, he cares for these folks. He, he cares deeply for them. And he wants the disciples to be a part of that, to, to see that. That this is, a, this is a team effort here, guys. This is We're all going to be part of what Christ is going to do today. Martin Lloyd-Jones says that as Christian people, we must learn to appropriate by faith the fact that God is our Father. Christ taught us to pray, our Father. This eternal, everlasting God has become our Father, and the moment we realize that, everything tends to change. He is our Father, and He is always caring for us, even when we have no concept of it. He loves us with an everlasting love, He so loved us that he sent his only begotten son into the world and to the cross to die for our sins. That is our relationship to God, and the moment we realize it, it transforms everything. But God is the God of order. So Jesus here, even at this moment, is going to demonstrate this. Where do we see this in other prior passages? Well, if you go back into Exodus, we see this very early on when Moses is given some very sound advice from his father-in-law which father-in-laws have some very sound wisdom to give. Amen? Son-in-laws aren't always the best and willing to listen, but when we do, we probably find that it's probably very good advice. But notice in Exodus 19, it says, The next day Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. (coughs) When Moses' father-in-law saw that all he was doing for the people, he said, What is this that you were doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another, and I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice. I will give you advice, and God will be with you. You shall represent the people for God and bring their cases to God, and you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, wait for it. Wait for it. Look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe. And place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you. You will be able to endure, and all this people also will go to their place in peace. It sounds to me like you described an actual efficient pastor. a, a, A shepherd who raises up other men. Because I don't know about you, I'm not omniscient. I can't be everywhere at one time. I'm not on I'm none of those things, right? I am a frail human just like you and I. I am a sinful man who has but limited capabilities. And for some of you are thinking, and they're very limited, and amen and thank you. They are. (laughs) But that's why that's why we have a plurality of leaders here. That's why we have five elders. I am not the grand pooba, okay? I don't walk around with a funny hat and a scepter, okay? I am an equal, I I am one amongst equals. So I love you, do not bring all your problems to me. We have a team that's biblical. If you don't like it, argue with the author, not the messenger. I'm not saying that there's not time and instances, but if we are to see God be most efficient, then then there are things that, 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 You know, some of our leaders have to have the time and the ability to do that are on a broader scale. As we spend time seeking the Lord's wisdom and guidance, and that's why we have others, I encourage you, I beg you, be in a small group. Get in a Sunday morning group or a Wednesday night group. If you're not and you're not being cared for properly, it's your fault. Do not blame us. You have the opportunity to be cared for. It doesn't mean that I don't care for you, but I can't care for 300 of you. There's no possible way. So we have to raise up more leaders, and that's what our small group leaders do. They are shepherding. They are caring for one another, right? We have ladies groups that are doing the same thing, that are caring for one another. Get involved in a group where there are a group of people around you. If I'm the 10th person to see you in the hospital, praise Jesus. That means stuff's working. If I'm the first and the only, we failed. Hello? Amen? 
If I'm the only one, we failed. That's not what God's design is. God uses people. He, God here in, in Christ, he is using the disciples to be part of this. They're part of this miracle, right? They are raising up and they are multiplying. R.C. Sproul said that the church has been established by Christ to be an army, but armies, in order to be effective, must be very sensitive and caring for their wounded. There is always a major work to be done within the church in terms of ministering to the needs of the people. Well, if you think about a military, there are actual uh, different areas, different levels, different leaders in different, different areas, right? You have to have an army. So get engaged. Paul further, Ephesians 4, what does Paul say? He says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints. Do we, let me reread that. I don't think you heard that right. So he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. Right, good? To what? To equip the who? You. You. To equip you. We're the saints. Not we're the saints to equip you for what? The work of the ministry. A, it's work. Amen? It's work. For why? For the building up the body of Christ. We're all part of the body of Christ. If you are a true born-again believer, you are part of the body of Christ. You each have a function. We are collectively together working as one body in Christ, who is our head. Amen? So, why? So, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And then notice it goes further. Why is this important? And why do we not see this in so many churches? It's because we don't understand this. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. We need to be raised, trained. We need to know right doctrine. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. You know the problem we have in churches today is we no longer have pews or chairs. The church is full of high chairs. And I'm talking about the sanctuary. And you know who sits in high chairs? Babies. And babies are cute, and we love them. But there comes a time and point, your baby needs to grow. And you feed your baby to start off with, amen? You have to teach them, you equip them, you, you, you raise them up to be able to feed themselves, okay? In the early goings, new Christians, it can be messy, amen? If you're a Christian, you were one of them, okay? That means somebody in a church at some point had to change your diapers, and I'm not talking physically. Although the sad part is, in this church, that could apply to me literally. So that's not probably the best, okay? But really, I mean, you know, that happens, right? Babies make messes, but that's how they grow. As long as you are constantly helping them to grow and you're working to teach them to feed themselves. If I or even any of our elders or our Sunday school teachers are the only ones in which you are being fed by, you are a disobedient Christian. You are disobeying a holy God. You and I are to grow in our faith. Why do you think Mike's pouring his time and efforts into some of these men to raise them up to then they go and do likewise? If he stops some showing up here over the next few years and doing these, then that means men stopped reproducing. It needs to be a continual that every man in this church, and you know we're focusing on the men because if the men get it, then the men should be leading their families well in this regard. We don't usually have a whole lot of issue with getting the ladies to step up in these areas, but we need to raise up, and we've got to get the babies out of the high chairs. And guess what happens when they get out of the high chair, right? They start running all over the place. 
and then you got to chase them, right? You got to put all these protective things on everything because they still can hurt themselves. But it's all part of them growing and maturing. And guess what? Eventually they know not to touch a hot stove, not to mess with an outlet, right? They start to learn, and you teach, and they grow. And guess what? In the end, you know who they look most like? You. <laughs> So if you have an issue, just look in the mirror once in a while because they're simply going to model what they see from you. That's the same way in the Christian life. As we raise up our children, as we raise up those around us to hopefully model what they see in us, that does not mean that we do not still have sin in our life that we are working through to get victory of, but we are growing in Christ. But notice through this then comes the last part. So he sends the men, the disciples out, they sit down in the grass, this glorious picture of this ultimate uh, last supper in the, in the heavenly realms. Then it says they all ate and were what? Satisfied. Are you satisfied? Are you desiring more? Well, I can't give it to you. Your spouse can't give it to you. It can only be in Christ. Christ is the only one who is enough. If you always chase after the, the latest fad, the, the newest thing, we will always continue to be empty. Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. You know, when David is writing Psalm 23, and he writes about the fact that the Lord has placed uh, him at a table surrounded by his enemies, he's trying to rem be, he's, the, God is reminding David that even though we all are going to have difficulties, we're going to have enemies. If we sit at the table, the idea is to look at that person who invited you to the table. If you were invited to a, a special banquet, a, a, a special meal with a king, are you going to be wandering around the palace looking at the wallpaper, uh, checking out uh, you know, what kind of towels they have? Or are you going to be so engrossed in just, in just that, that moment that you've been invited by the king? Because when we focus and when we are satisfied in Jesus, nothing else matters. No matter what this world throws our way, no matter what happens in the political realm, no matter what happens in, in, in any area of our life, no matter what happens in our jobs or whatever, nothing will matter because it is Christ who satisfies us. As a close, I just want to uh, read this quote that Jim Elliott uh, shared years ago. And you remember, uh, many of you have probably read Elizabeth Elliott's Through Gates of Splendor. Or for which is uh, I recommend everybody read, but I also recommend if you're a young man or any man read Nate Saint's Jungle Pilot, just excellent. Um, but Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, Ed McCauley, Pete Fleming, Roger Yodarin, uh, five young men, uh, five young men, Wheaton College graduates, uh, have a heart to reach the nations. So they are called to go to Ecuador. They fly into Guayaquil. And from Guayaquil, they end up uh, moving to uh, Quito for uh, a while until ultimately they go deep into the jungles in Ecuador, into the Amazon, because they are going to reach the Wyadani. That is who that they have been called to reach, the Alka Indians. This is a cannibalistic Indian group, that uh, tribal group, who have never, forget here in the gospel, they've never seen the outside world. They have no knowledge of of, of anyone outside of their tribe. But as they work over time to establish uh, some rapport, to go and to develop what they can to hopefully go in and share the gospel. And you, 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 many of you know the story. If not, I highly recommend watching the End of the Spear movie if, if you can. But as they ultimately that fateful day 
decide that this was the day that they are to go. And they are ultimately uh, ambushed, and, and each of these men give their lives. They are all martyred for their faith. But the story didn't stop there, did it? Because Elizabeth Elliot, Marge Saint, Rachel Saint, uh, which um, Rachel Saint actually used to come and stay in Ashland. I don't know if many of you know that, but across from where Food Line is, there's a big white house there. Uh, Pastor Burkett, who pastored at Carmel Baptist for years, started the Christian radio station in Ashland, used to host uh, uh, Pastor Burkett and uh, Miss Carol uh, would host her and she would come. It's pretty remarkable uh, that little town of Ashland would have uh, Rachel Saint come and, and, and shared about all that God did. But through their efforts over the coming years, that tribal group would come to faith in Jesus Christ. And they would now, they're now considered the Y Donnie and Don Fanning, who is a, uh, was a professor for many years at Liberty, uh, started to work with the Y Donnie and they actually established this little helicopter, uh, this little uh, jungle jumper uh, that they would use deep in the heart of the Amazon to bounce around to village and village to share the gospel. It's just a fascinating, fascinating. I encourage you to look beyond even just the uh, little story. But this is what Jim Elliott said. He said, we are so utterly ordinary, so commonplace, while we profess to know a power, notice capitalized, the 20th century does not reckon with. He's speaking of Christ. But we are harmless and therefore unharmed. We are spiritual pacifists, non-militants, conscientious objectors in this battle to the death with principalities and powers in high places. Meekness must be had for contact with men but brass, outspoken boldness is required to take part in the camaraderie of the cross. We are sideliners, coaching and criticizing the real wrestlers, while content to sit by and leave the enemies of God unchallenged. The world cannot hate us. We are too much like it. We are, we, we are too much like its own. Oh, that God would make us dangerous. It's a pretty powerful prayer right there to pray that God would make us dangerous. And I want to encourage us that we would be the voice for the voiceless. Many of you uh, this week were part of the March for Life. This is not a political issue. And if I'm being watched online, I hope somebody hears me. If you think that standing for the right to life is political, you have missed the gospel. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the way. Jesus is life, and therefore we need to be a voice. We need to stand for issues that matter to Christ. It is the authority of God's word we have, so we must be willing to stand. And in that same vein, we must share the gospel. We must be willing to share the, the cure that we have for lostness. It is Jesus Christ. So in just a minute, uh, Danny's going to come up here and he's going to lead us in the time uh, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. But I just want to encourage us this morning. The disciples, they didn't even know they were in the game half the time, right? They had no idea what Jesus was doing, but Jesus was building them up. And these men, ultimately these 11 men, as Judas will, will, will ultimately betray, but these 11 men changed the world. By Acts 17, this is the world had been turned upside down because these men got it. It took a while, but they got it, and they changed the world. Folks, we serve the same God. We have the same Holy Spirit inside of us that's existed since the dawn of creation. We have the ability, if we would just walk in the Spirit of God and trust in Him to see things change, but they will change as we share the hope of the gospel as we love folks, yes, that will require at times meeting needs, but to meet needs, to meet needs apart from the gospel is in vain. It must be done in order to share the gospel. So I just want to encourage us to be in prayer. Tomorrow is a simple little opportunity. We're gonna, we're gonna, we've got pray at 2.30 tomorrow with us. We're going to be meeting with the principal. You know, we shared a few weeks ago, and there's no good news clubs in any schools in all of Hanover County, all of Henrico, all of Richmond. One in Chesterfield, two in Spotsylvania. There is one that hopefully was going to be hopefully starting soon uh, in, in Beaverdam as well, but we want to see this. I mean, we have these open opportunities if we're willing to step into them, and, and it's incredible opportunity. So just be praying for that, that we can see God do some incredible things. Father, we thank you for, 
your precious word that, God, you um, have given us uh, through uh, the word of God. Father, these are truths that we can stand on, stand under, and, Father, guide us in all matters that all authority is your authority. So, Father, we just pray that, God, that anyone here today that has not by faith trusted in your Son, Jesus, as their Lord and Savior, that, Father, today would be the day of salvation. And for those that have, Father, that they would make that next step of obedience in their public proclamation of faith and in baptismal, Father, and we'll be celebrating a baptism next Sunday night, and, Father, uh, those that have stepped from darkness into your glorious light. So, Father, may you be glorified, may you be honored, and, Father, may we be part of uh, the great work you're doing, God. You were doing this work, and you invite us into it, just as these disciples were passing around baskets of fish and, and bread that just continually multiplied, God, because you were doing the great work. We cannot save anyone, but, Father, who in this crowd this morning will simply carry a basket out into the crowd? Who this morning will simply go into the crowd and as you work mightily in and through us, we will see great things for our Savior. So, Father, we praise you for all that you are doing, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> should, I, uh, should I take a bite of bread? Uh, all right. So as we... Get to come into this time of remembrance. We have the kids coming in, which is awesome. We're all looking around for their parents. Maybe you guys help them out. having the kids with us in worship service. We love that some of them get to celebrate communion alongside with us. We love that some of them get to see an example of their family or friend or whoever that they're, uh, that they're with today. It's, it's just so cool. And so during this time of remembrance, we're going to be reading out of 2 Corinthians 5, if anybody wants to flip there in their Bible. But during this time, like, what are we remembering? Why do we do this? Well, first we do it because Jesus told us to. He said, as often as you do this. So for some, that's weekly, that's monthly for us, the last Sunday of every month. It doesn't matter how often it is. But why? What's the remembrance all about? What's well, Jesus' sacrifice is what it's all about. It's that God offers total forgiveness for all of our sin forever because of his sacrifice. And so in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, many theologians say this is the greatest gospel verse in the entire Bible. You know, I have it underlined in my Bible. It says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So what? Is, what? Why is that the greatest? Well, he, God, made him... Jesus to be sin and it's like well what do you mean he made Jesus to be sin only in one sense in, in the sense that he treated Jesus as if he committed every sin ever committed by every person who would ever believe when in fact Jesus committed none of them not one hanging on the cross Jesus was holy he was harmless he was undefiled hanging on the cross Jesus was a spotless lamb he was never for a split second a sinner he was holy God on the cross God punished Jesus more practically for my sin. Turned right around and treats me as if I lived his life. That's the great doctrine of substitution, substituting Jesus for me. On that doctrine turned the entire reformation of the church. That's the heart of the gospel. That's why we come together. What you get is complete forgiveness covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. When he looks at the cross, he sees you. When he looks at you, he sees Christ. If the deacons can come up and serve us.
So it says, as they were eating. And so again, Jesus having an intimate time of fellowship with his closest friends, the people he spent the most time with. There's 11 of them there with him. Remember, Judas is gone at this point. And he said, I want you to do this often. Why? Why does Jesus say that? Well, first of all, because he knows me. He knows you. He knows we get busy with life, right? He, he knows it tends as time stretches out, we forget things and forget importance of things. You know, I don't know if you've had a, a close relationship with a friend and t too much time goes in between you spending time together. Um, and then you get back together and you're like, why do we do that? Th the same thing happens with us. And so Christ knows that, okay? And he knows that we forget about the ultimate sacrifice. We, we remember with lip service, but in our heart, we forget. We forget that he hung on that cross. We forget that his blood was spilled for you, for me, so God can have that close relationship with us. And so it says right there, he took the bread, which represents his body that was torn to pieces. And after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And then he took the cup. Again, it's dark. It's filled up. They're sharing. He took the cup and said, hey, this is going to be my blood, guys. Look at this. Look at the color of it. It's going to be poured out all over the ground. Not just on the cross, but leading up to the cross. Not just for you, of course, but for everybody that's going to come after you too. For all of us. And when he had given thanks, and it's amazing that each time he gave thanks because he knew what it represented. His sacrifice saves us. He gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And we hope many more that will come after us. Father, thank you, Lord, so much for your sacrifice, your willing sacrifice. That you did that for me. That you did that for all of us in the room. That know you as our Lord and Savior. Father, we could never thank you enough, but in this small way, this morning, at this time, we pour out our heart with drinks of gratitude for you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
quick announcements. Uh, first of all, a uh, reminder that our Adventure Club, uh, 4.30 this afternoon, the youth are meeting from 4 until 6.30. They're going to have a game time together, so they'll be here until 6.30, and then the adults meet here in the sanctuary from 5 until 6 o'clock for a time of prayer. Next Sunday, 6 o'clock, we're going to have a baptism. We have several candidates that will uh, be getting baptized right behind me, and then Eric Josephson will be uh, bringing the message that'll be from 6 to 7 um, next Sunday. A couple of youth notes real quick. Uh, their trip to the uh, Museum of the Bible is scheduled for April the 28th. Um, it's a $21 cost. It's due by April the 7th. There's a QR code in the uh, Church Center app or on the bulletin if you would like to get your child signed up and make that payment. Uh, this upcoming Saturday is going to be a busy one. We have a work day starting at 8 a.m. Uh, we have uh, projects and jobs that need to be done both inside and outside the church. And then there's also going to be the yard sale and bake sale. All proceeds go into the youth and mission feuds. That will be out um, towards the garage. Um, lastly, or next to last, if you're a uh, new partner, if you were voted in this past Wednesday and you're here, if you'd come to the front, we just want people to come by and say hello to you again real quick. So don't be shy. Um, and then last but not least, while they're making their way to the front, I'm going to ask Denny to come up because next Sunday uh, we're going to do a core group seminar, and it's going to be focused on stewardship, and they will be the first Sunday of all of our five Sunday months. So uh, next Sunday and then again in June, September, and December. But he's going to detail some of that and let you know where you uh, exactly need to go next Sunday morning. All right, yep, yeah, so Pastor Mike asked uh, the stewardship ministry if we would um, come and do some teaching during Sunday school, so the answer is obviously yes. And so um, next Sunday, and then one Sunday per quarter, so once every three months, stewardship is going to be teaching on stewardship. How do we steward our time? We all get the same 24 hours in the day. What does the Bible say about that? Our talents, we all have talents, our treasure. And so, uh, next Sunday, if you are in my class or Patrick's class, you'll be up here in the sanctuary, and Cheryl and Chris Boma will be leading us uh, up here. And if you are in Bill's or Mike's class, you'll be downstairs, and Candace and Bill will be, uh, will be leading that session. And the next uh, session will be something different. So, if you're in neither class, you got the pick of the litter, baby, upstairs or downstairs, whatever, uh, whatever you want to do, but please do come. Um, because we want to hang out with you guys. And so I'll let Bill come on up. Oh, so if all our new partners will just kind of line the front. I'm going to introduce you for those that do not know you. Um, we have Aaron and Megan Ogburn who are here to my left, your right. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Doug and Catherine McDougall. We have Elaine Rogers. Margaret Woods and Diane Bowserman. So once Bill is closed up and finished in prayer, please come up and welcome them in as uh, the newest members of the Guelph Me family. Please join with me in our closing prayer and benediction. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time to be in your house to just worship you, Lord. Father, I ask and pray for your blessing upon the new members of our church body here. And Father, I pray that you'll be with us as we leave the walls of this building to take your love into the world, to be salt and light in all that we do. And Father, as Aaron told those uh, the blessing, Lord, I pray that the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>